So from, well, you can see the kind of photos behind us, but we have Lauren, Head of News and Features at Vogue, Anya, the founder and editor-in-chief at Vestoy, and Georgina, the co-founder of Cimen. And we are obviously wanting to talk about the kind of future of fashion uh, media, but first of all, I'd really like to kind of find out from both of you two, like, why did you both kind of found each of your kind of publications and organizations? What gap did you see in the marketplace? Georgina, you have the microphone, so maybe if you don't mind going first. Um, well, my, both um, my business partner and I used to work for Mario Testino, the fashion photographers. So content was really kind of what we were faced with every day and it was a really interesting time because we were working with you know the biggest media companies the you know the biggest brands and I think it was also a time when everyone started to become obsessed with I guess it's like the refinery 29 of content so mm -hmm. it was getting more distilled it was getting kind of like shorter and shorter and bite-sized like I have friends that work at big publications, news publications, and they were started to be kind of voted and paid according to clicks. And it was it was insane because it was like we were all becoming almost like drug addicts to small content, to short form content. You know, it was all about the scroll. How can you stop someone in a feed? So, you know, we always used to joke that like everyone has dinner party conversation and you can kind of read the headlines and you can like, you know, sit at dinner and kind of like carry a good conversation. But I think there was such a lack of, of real content mm -hmm. and real engagement and actually trying to, you know, and I think it was really interesting because in the men's sector, it was really, it was, you know, actually starting to be interesting. And I think there were a lot of players that were kind of really pushing it and saying, okay, well, what does our take on the political stance or how do we feel about culture or art or lifestyle or travel? And I think that, you know, for women, it was like, how to get thin or get laid, you know, that was kind of, that Two was options. kind of it. It, it was, and it mm -hmm. was really sad, and it was in a list. It was like the 10 ways to get thin <laughs> and all the five ways to get laid. Um, and, you know, I think we, we were very much the men's first customers, and it was like, this is not what we want. You know, we want to understand, you know, yes, fashion style is incredibly important to us, but so is travel and culture and art mm -hmm. and, you know, having an opinion so I think that you know for us it was a lack but it was also an amazing time to kind of see an opportunity so and maybe if you can just tell us in a couple of sentences hopefully everyone in the audience already knows uh Simen, but maybe if you can Anyone explain what it is yes one hand <laughs> number one fan um so Simen is a content and commerce platform it's called Simen because every single week we feature a different person so we featured anyone from actress Jemima Kirk to um, Rohan Silva, the founder of Second Home, Daniel Arsham, the contemporary artist, Cyril Gooch, the founder of Parley, to Dita Von Tees and Claudia Schiffer. So it's a complete mix of people. Um, and we, every single week, takes on their personalities. So we create all of our own content. So it could be video content, podcasts, um, and the whole week is basically a takeover of them. So it's their art picks, it's their travel guides, their music playlists, it's their tips, it's their, you know, shoppable Instagram. It's completely uh, lifestyle. And everything is shoppable. So you can buy the art, the fashion, the food, the travel, everything. Excellent. Thanks. Maybe if I can turn to you now, Anya, and if you can tell us similarly, of what is Vestoy? Yeah. So Vestoy, I like to... Uh, describe it as a platform for uh, critical thinking. So it started uh, nine, almost ten years ago now with an annual journal. So the journal has changed uh, shape and look over the years, but now we've settled on this kind of um, book journal type form. Each year it deals with a different uh, topic. So topics are tend to be quite universal and not necessarily um, topics you immediately think of in relation to fashion. So we've dealt with failure, for instance. Um, another topic was power, magic, shame. And this most recent one deals with authenticity. And so the idea with the, uh, with the magazine or with the journal is to look at, I mean, to bridge really um, theory and uh, practice in fashion. So scholarship and research about fashion and analysis uh, of the industry. So we have prose, we have interviews, we have um, literature, theory, 
visual essays. So it's kind of a, um, I don't know, interdisciplinary, let's say, approach to uh, thinking about fashion. And then now we also have uh, a website. And we have uh, social media that uh, Corinna has dragged me into and yes. now manages for Vestoy. Um, maybe we'll, we'll have a chance, I'm sure we will, to, have, to speak more about social media um, later because it's, it's a, that is a way of thinking that um, I still feel totally conflicted about, <laughs> even though we're like, in that world now. But, um, and something that I, we also do and that I do feel much more comfortable with um, are live events. So those are, uh, they happen as and when inspiration strikes. And they are typically um, performative, somewhere between theater and performance art, working with um, actors or performers or everyday people to, um, again, engage with fashion in, a, in this critical um, thinking kind of way, inspire um, the audience to think more deeply about why we wear what we wear when we wear it. Excellent. Thank you. And maybe, Lauren, if I can kind of dive into you with a slightly different question. We've talked a lot about the kind of the changing pace of uh, the environment, et cetera. And you obviously work for a very large, well-established organization. What kind of things are kind of happening in relation to strategy or trends or content that you can see even in the last kind of six months that you're able to, to kind of tell us about? Yeah, so uh, first thing I'll mention is that there are 22 Vogues. Um, got Amer American Vogue, which is owned by Kylie Nass in the US, and then got Kylie Nass International, which owns 11 Vogues, and the rest are licensed. So mm -hmm. other people understand Vogue. It means something in the culture. It's a big global brand. Historically, they've been run pretty much autonomously out of their individual markets. Mm -hmm. um, and it was only about, which worked really well for print, and it was only about 18, 12, 18 months ago that we took autonomy out of Condé Nast International's brand values. Mm -hmm. Um, because again, this was a strategy that was working really well for print and authority in the respective markets, but online, people expect brands to behave differently and they expect them to behave more globally. So um, about two years ago, Kynas International decided to make a big investment in Vogue digitally. Um, that meant increasing the size and the expertise of the teams in all of our regions, but also creating a central team, which is like, we have so many, we now feel like a te technology company because the number of engineers who are working there. So mm -hmm. I mentioned there were 22 Vogue, so they are on 22 different CMSs. Um, and so the first thing we're doing is, is bringing them all onto the same CMS, which is not super sexy, but like it has to be done. Yep. Um, and then they also decided to hire a central editorial team, which we, I, I was the first hire about a year and a half ago. We're about 35 people now. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got like a growth team and a video team. Uh, we've launched uh, Snapchat for British Vogue and Vogue Paris. Um, we've got a social storytelling a team that's really focused on Instagram, um, a central photo desk that any of our Vogues globally can can put in photo requests. Lots of fun licensing agreements that we've redone there. And then um, my team, which is the smallest, which does the old, you know, copy news and features. Um, so that's really, really where we are. And we, you know, we set the growth targets because, you know, Vogue is, is quite small if you add up all the little websites, but if you put them together, it, it is really big. So figuring out ways that we can leverage that, setting their growth targets, making sure that they can achieve them, but also, you know, under helping under Vogue, the Vogue, Vogue digital teams understand that it is important. It is the future we have underinvested, but that's totally changed now. So change it. And maybe if I can uh, go next back to you, Georgina, to talk about you founded your platform based on uh, a really unique balance of content and commerce. Um, how is that, has, has that evolved since launch? And, and I don't know if you can just kind of explain us a little bit about why you think that's critical, maybe from a consumer perspective as well. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, the, the most important thing, and I think, well, to be honest, I think we were really lucky that we came at it from both sides. I think it was, you know, when we launched Cement, it was a time it was, you know, pre-Porter, Netta Porter had the edit, and it was like time of like shop bazaar. So I think on both sides, like the media companies were starting to think, okay, you know, how do we strong arm products into what we're talking about? And the same on the other side, I think all of these big, big e-tailers were like, okay, how can we sell more products? So I think the whole 
start of content and commerce wave. I think it's evolved a lot now, but I think it started in a kind of weirdly disingenuous way where it was just about like adding one on top of the other. Mm. And I think we were at a really kind of lucky time where we could see this happening and say, okay, well, let's, let's kind of push on both sides. You know, if we were to have our kind of you know, dream commerce experience, what would that look like? And and the same with the content. So, you know, Semen really was a kind of marrying of the two. And I think that it it's a space that's super interesting because there's so much kind of evolution happening. And I think that what's what's really important is to understand the user and, and what they want and also the kind of touch point. And I think that, you know, content is, I mean, it's like the biggest buzzword. It's a bit of a joke. And people just think they like add a layer. It's like cream. You just like add a layer and like things will get better. But I think that, you know, what what was really important for us was like context as well. Mm -hmm. and, and we really looked at kind of really quite obscure examples of who was doing it well. So, you know, in the high end, mainly offline, but they're online too, is like the line in New York. Um, but, you know, what was kind of a big, inspiration was also Ikea as well because you know they have it down you you kind of walk in and you go through the like top layer and you know it's Ikea but it still makes you dream you understand you're that person you're living that world you're like oh I wouldn't necessarily look at this you know red light but somehow in this context in this environment it makes sense I'm relatable to this person that they've created and then you go downstairs and it's you know frictionless and you kind of get your products and you leave and I think that you know, what's what's really interesting for us is really understanding the two sides. So mm -hmm. what does content and commerce look like online? And also where I think there's a massive opportunity is is offline. And it's kind of in our trajectory of, of growth, we're really starting to look at the offline space, which is like, for us, like beyond exciting. But it's, you know, and I think that that's where you're really going to see the innovation because, you know, I mean, I'm from London and if you're... If you go on Oxford Street and you kind of see the high street, it's, you know, largely quite uninspiring. Mm. And, you know, some of these stores have the biggest, most incredible real estate. And they almost think of themselves as just purely commerce players where it's like, actually, no, like you need to create content and you need to create context. And mm. I think that, you know, because digital has become so kind of like prominent in everyone's mind I think everyone thinks of content living online and then the content that almost lives offline becomes a bit you know sometimes gimmicky and it's about you know kind of weird tech advances whereas I think you know what what's really interesting is is the fantasy of the content and you know like the line for instance uh you know, they've been doing it for a while, but they're, you know, amazing inspiration for us because you walk into the, does, do people know the line, the store? And you walk in and you, you know, you feel the girl, you see her bedroom, you see her bathroom, you see her products, it's curated. They've, you know, they've thought about the touch point of the user. They're like, mm. okay, you know, we're not going to make content for the sake of making content, but we're actually going to, to use it to engage and inspire. And I think that, you know, that's something that's, that's super interesting and I think that there's going to be a huge kind of shift in thinking with you know what is the future of a shopping mall like they have the perfect platform to create content and commerce and I think that you know for us we try and really take a step back and see the landscape and you know I mean we're hoping to launch something um, in the coming years so you know I'm hoping that we can see it kind of differently. Excellent. We've only got six minutes left, so I might have to ask you to go faster with your answers. Um, before we come on to talking about the tech stuff, I'd just like to quickly ask you, Anya, about you deliberately decided not to have a commerce model around, as in you don't have advertising. And I, if you can just maybe say like why you think that's important to the publication. Yeah, I mean, to um, it's curious. I feel in this context, uh, speaking about context, I feel pretty much like a contrarian. I feel rather um, uh, anti-tech in a way because uh, to me, what uh, I mean, the driver. I mean, first of all, the the media that I use is uh, it's a tried and tested medium mm -hmm. it's publications, right? Um, and when I started, um, I I was looking at the other magazines that um, were out there and, and how the fashion industry 
works and how very um, squeezed editors and writers and image makers often get uh, by advertisers because uh, publications, I mean, um, since the beginning, in fact, of the 20th century have relied on advertising in order to keep the price very low so that more people will buy and consume uh, your point of view. Um, in fashion, that's really led to, I mean, I, I'm sure I don't need to, uh, I'm sure I'm, I feel like I'm speaking to the converted already. You know how hard I'm sure it is for, um, uh, for an editor or for a publisher to have um, uh, free thought and free speech. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was thinking how I could make um, a publication or a platform that, uh, where I wouldn't have to face those particular problems, where I wouldn't find myself in a situation where I would have to say no thank you to a squillion dollars from somebody who wanted to place an ad on my back cover in return for something I would feel reluctant to give away, mm. um, which then I would see as my integrity. And so I tried to find an alternative model, and that model has meant um, today being part of a uh, university in London, London College Fa of Fashion, where I'm a research fellow. So I see Vestoy much more as um, a research product and something much more aligned with um, knowledge than with commerce. And I, I wouldn't, I mean, I would never call myself an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. which is why I feel... Um, uh, like a kind of contrarian in this context. Um, to me, what's um, important is uh, much more to say to a potential reader that there is um, another way, an alternative way to look at fashion, which does not have to do with uh, getting late or getting, you know, <laughs> thin. <laughs> Or shopping more, or you know, all of the things that we are so used to um, imbibing from our media, but rather to to um, encourage the reader or the visitor to a performance or whatever mm. to think um, critically, to become a skeptic. I think skepticism is extremely important and often forgotten. I know it's not important for companies, though. It is. It helps you be objective and find new things. Right. Okay. I'm going to squeeze. I'm going to have to do like a quick fire round for this last section. No, no, it's fine. It's, there's too much kind of good stuff. But you talked about kind of print being kind of tried and tested. I wonder, Lauren, if you can tell us like how do you the kind of the testing or adaption of kind of content once it's out there? Is that something that you do at Vogue International? Is that something you can... I wish the answer was yes, and I could tell you we do A-B <laughs> testing for newsletters. But yeah. no, um, we're, you know, we're, we're catching up. Um, do you, we actually don't do very much. It varies by markets. Um, I can speak probably more when I was at Fashionista, which was we did lots of headline testing, and we put them on social, and when headlines weren't working, we kept changing them. Mm -hmm. um, the Vogue's do do that around search, but unfortunately nothing more sexy than that. I'm sorry. That's all right. If I can, I'm going to quickly jump to my next question to you, Georgina, about, <laughs> about um, AI influencers. So you recently worked with one of the most famous ones at the moment, and I wonder if you can tell us why you did it, how did it work again in um, like so 30 we seconds? we featured Michaela. <laughs> Um, and it was amazing because she's she's like a fully AI influencer. And it's so funny because people see it as so kind of like new and cool and modern, but it's like all of the real influencers are basically her. You know, like loads of people that I know that are kind of, you know, the kind of classic social influencers, they've, they have like their own kind of personal Instagram. And I think that, you know, we all of us that spend God knows how many times on our phone, on Instagram or Facebook, we're doing the exact same as what she is. You know, mm. we're building our online persona. We go and we edit it, we curate it, we enhance it, we look back, we edit it again. We, So I think that, you know, actually what she is, is just a mirror to our society now. And I think that there is you know, it's... And can you t did she sell products for you? She was amazing. She was a good seller. Yeah. And I think we're going to work with her again. And I think what's really interesting, and it was so good to watch the, you know, Hello Me thing, because we want to, like, really work with her again to try and, like, really bring her alive. Like, she's mm. a musician. How amazing, like, the Tupac one to create a concert with her. I think people will fall in love with her. She's probably going to have a virtual boyfriend. Like, <laughs> I think it's... I think it, the sky is the limit. 
Um, to bring it kind of back to kind of, we've got 43, 42 seconds left. No, I'll just skip to the last question, which is about kind of what's your kind of dream for the long term version of media in like five seconds each, whether that's a, something you really want to see. You kind of had a good answer for this one earlier. You want to go last? I know Anya says. Well, I, I mean, I've said already to you guys that I, uh, I mean, I fly the flag for critical thinking. So I, I'm all for thoughtfulness. I'm for reflection. I'm mm -hmm. for uh, questioning. Really, that's what I. Uh, feel we sometimes lack, um, whether it's down to speed or or perhaps because we're unsure of uh, our own opinions and need, you know, influencers to back them up or whatnot, I don't know. But I, if, if I could wish for something, it's that uh, each and every one of us will spend a little bit more time thinking a little bit more critically about what we consume. Um, what what our personas are, what our persons are. Um, yeah, listen less to influencers. That's what I think. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I'm so sorry to kind of cut you short for that. <laughs>